Welcome to today's Federalist Society virtual event. This afternoon, Thursday, June 2nd, we will be discussing Alexander Solzhenitsyn's essay, Live Not by Lies. I'm Alita Kass, Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at the Federalist Society and Director of the Freedom of Thought Project, an initiative addressing new challenges and questions involving freedoms of thought, conscience, and expression. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion offered today are those of the experts on today's program. Today's program is a virtual fireside chat on Live Not By Lies, a four-page essay by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Released nearly 50 years ago, the insights remain fresh, and today's discussion will consider how this work might apply to the challenges of today. Leading this discussion, Judge Stephanus Bebus of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, speaking with Professor Eugene Volok, the Gary T. Schwartz Distinguished Professor of Law at the UCLA Law School. We encourage our audience to submit questions for our, speaker, for our speakers through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Judge Bebus will be referring to submitted questions as he guides the discussion. Thank you all for being with us today. Judge Bebus, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Alita and the Federal Society for setting this up. And, and thank you to my uh, dear friend and, and distinguished scholar, Eugene Volok, uh, for prompting this conversation. Eugene, let me turn it over to you. You've been thinking about this question for a long time, perhaps since you uh, emigrated from the former Soviet Union. Uh, why don't you talk to us about what, what lessons we in America might think about starting to draw from the experiences of a a country that is no longer exists uh, in a completely different century. Uh, sure, thanks very much uh, for having me. And uh, Judge Bebas, thanks very much for participating in, in this conversation. Um, uh, so uh, just stepping back a little bit, uh, one thing that I've long observed about First Amendment law is there are lots of theories of free speech out there about self-expression, about self-government, about search for truth, marketplace of ideas. Lots of really smart people have said a lot about them throughout the centuries. Um, but there's very little by way of theory of compelled speech. Why should we be opposed to speech compulsions? Uh, after all, one possible, one possible distinction might be restricting speech takes things out of the marketplace of ideas. Compelling speech merely adds things to the marketplace. And in fact, in certain situations, we do treat them differently. Uh, for example, you know, if, if there's a law that says you can't send letters to the government saying certain things, that would be pretty bad, probably violate the petition clause. But there are all sorts of laws saying you have to provide all sorts of information to the government about taxes, about census information, a variety of other such things. Um, uh, likewise, uh, the Supreme Court has said, some disagree with it, but it has said that it's okay to um, uh, for the law to require shopping malls to allow speakers on their property. Uh, even though if the government were to say, look, shopping malls can't host speakers, well, that would be pretty clearly unconstitutional. So um, uh, one question is, why is it that we disapprove of speech compulsions? And it turns out to be a question that Alexander Solzhenitsyn also tried to answer, though it's important uh, he tried it not just in a different country, in a different regime, but also at, um, from a different perspective. He was speaking about as a political thinker, political and moral thinker, and thinking about how it is that one can promote political change. That doesn't necessarily transfer over into legal or constitutional thinking. And yet I thought that some of the insights that he had are potentially helpful. So what I want to do is just very quickly run through a few excerpts from this essay of his. Uh, which was uh, the last thing uh, he wrote, I think, before he was expelled from the Soviet Union in 1974. It was published in the Washington Post in English, English translation. Uh, I think probably at that point he had already, he had already perhaps arrived in, in, in the US. Um, so I wanna give you a few excerpts. So the first line is, the univert is one that I like in part because it's well-written and in part because it's very Russian. Russians have a reputation as being, Russians and others in that part of the world, Poles as well, have a reputation as being kind of morose and pessimistic people because we have much to be morose and pessimistic about uh, throughout our history. Uh, but he was speaking specifically about communism. And by the way, 
late stage communism. He actually wasn't writing in the context of the Stalin era, in the context of where indeed saying something wrong was very likely to get you killed and almost certain to get you to, to get you in, in into the gulag. This is the Brezhnev era. People would get fired a lot. Sometimes they would get imprisoned or locked up in mental hospitals. But the, poss the possibility of talking about these things uh, was, was real there. So he was talking about spiritual death. Uh, and the spiritual death, essentially, of a nation that he felt had been cowed into submission, but not just cowed into silence. Um, when he, so he was talking about dehumanization. We have dehumani dehumanized ourselves. We have given away our principles. We've given away our souls so as not to, dis to disturb our meager, wretched existence. We lack strength, pride, passion. And again, um, uh, we lack strength, pride, and passion, not just because they're silenced. Interestingly, one of the things he said, perhaps, because the reality was actually speaking out remained perilous for people. And, perhaps demanding that his fellow Russians speak out or fellow Soviet citizens speak out uh, uh, might have been too big an ask. Uh, uh, rather, he was saying that we should begin, we should begin by pushing ourselves, uh, ourselves away from the soul-destroying system we have um, at, it, at its most sensitive point. And that point is the lie. Um, Force, he says, quickly ages. Uh, and that, again, refers to, to, to uh, uh, Russian history. Uh, of course, the, the Stalin, in the Stalin era, force was utterly routine uh, and uh, uh, a deadly force uh, exerted on millions. Uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, Stalin's enemies, but even not his enemies, people he thought might become his enemies, were routinely killed. Then you get to, to post-Stalin Russia. You know, 1964, Khrushchev gets deposed, but he lives out his life under house arrest, in his, but in a dacha, you know, of all the places to be under house arrest, probably not that bad. At least he doesn't get killed. It was in part precisely because of a reaction to Stalinism on the part of the people at the top. The sense was, look, we're no longer in a position where everything in our lives is controlled directly by force. Rather, the government realizes that it needs to keep, to keep the people in line by lying to them. And not just by lying to them, by absorbing them into the process of lying, by requiring them to lie. And that is, in Solzhenitsyn's view, what helps dehumanize people, what helps destroy their souls, what helps make them powerless to to resist because they have become complicit in the lie. The, um, the force no longer places its paw on every shoulder, demands for us only submission to the lie, everyday participation in the lie. And that's what he wanted to, to, to speak out against. And the key to his liberation, by the way, no, key to liberation. Again, he is setting forth an agenda for political action. Maybe he's wrong. It's an it's an empirical question, right? What, what's going to be successful, what, what's not? And it's an interesting question how ultimately the Soviet regime fell. Um, uh, but his claim is that this is a key to liberation, personal refusal to participate in the lie. Uh, perhaps the lie rules everything, but at least let it rule not through me. Uh, and the agenda he proposes is not consciously supported anything the lie recognizing where the boundary of the lie is. And by the way, each will see it differently. He, says. he acknowledges that different people will have different views. He's not saying everybody has to come around to my vision. Of course, he'd prefer it. Uh, but he's just saying, look, figure out for yourselves what you think is a lie and step away from this gangrenous boundary. Um, uh, and when you do that, you'll be shocked how quickly and helplessly the lie will fall away so that that which ought to be naked will be seen by the world as naked. Let each of us choose his own path. Uh, will he remain the conscious servant of the lie? Or has he, is he going to become an honest person deserving of respect of his children and his contemporaries? That's another claim about kind of political life. The claim that before we can do anything to change, to change the system, we need to have 
We need to perceive ourselves and be perceived by others as honest people. And we need to step away from anything that makes us into dishonest people. And from that day forward, he will not write or sing or print any single phrase that distorts, in his opinion, the truth. In painting, sculpture, photography, music, or technological means, it's quite elaborate. It's almost like one of those contracts uh, where, where you want to cover everything. But he does want to cover everything. Not a single distortion of the truth that he recognizes. Um, if we are too cowardly, then we are nothing. We're hopeless, and we deserve the contempt of which Pushkin wrote, being a good Russian. So he knew it's always good to quote Pushkin. It's a great stanza. He only quoted three lines. I'm going to quote all six from this particular particular stanza. Uh, graze on, graze on, submissive nation. You will not wake to honor's call. Why offer herds their liberation? For them, our shears are slaughter stall. Their heritage each generation. The yoke with jingles, the yoke that, uh, that an ox would have uh, uh, on him, and the gall. Um, so again, the notion is that if we are to resist this, if we are to resist uh, being a submissive nation, if we are to actually act democratically, this is all about democratic self-government. You know, so Nixon was not quite a Democrat, lowercase d Democrat in the American sense. He was a complicated man with a lot of ideas that were not modern Western liberal. Uh, but he was interested in the Russian nation recovering its self-government. And the key to that was to stop being the cattle and at least become honest people. Not necessarily ones who will say things, but at least ones who will not conspire in the lie. So that's his theory. Uh, to become an honest person deserving of respect of his children and of his contemporaries, to resist the universal spiritual debt, that's a means of promoting individual autonomy as a means of promoting the search for truth and democratic self-government. If you try to map him into his thinking into some of these theories that First Amendment scholars have come up with and pre-First Amendment free speech for press scholars had come up with, people like John Stuart Mill and the authors of Cato's letters and such, it's not that he's arguing for self-expression or that he's arguing for democratic self-governance. He's arguing for them put together that you can't be an effective participant in democratic self-government if you don't respect yourself and if you don't exercise the individual autonomy to refuse to be complicit in things that you believe, rightly or wrongly, that you believe are the lie. So silence itself is a message. It's a message that you're no longer complicit. And it's a moral duty. It's a duty to yourself. It's a duty to your children. It's a duty to your countrymen. And silence is cleansing. One other line, which I didn't quote before, he who will begin to cleanse himself will with his cleansed glance easily find other occasions to, to, do, to do more. So that's, that's his theory. Again, it's a theory set for, an, for a totalitarian country, which we are not in, not even close, thankfully. Um, it's also a theory, again, about political change. It doesn't tell us how the law should react to that. It also isn't sensitive to a lot of the details that we are familiar with the First Amendment law. So for example, you know, the fact is if you're a government employee, you're going to be compelled to say a lot of things because it's often your job to say certain things. If you are hired to teach, especially in the K through 12 level where there's no academic freedom general, for principles generally speaking, if you're hired to teach a subject, presumably, you know, they can insist that you teach it and teach it the way you want, they want you to teach it or else find another job. So, you know, that may have to be the reality. Uh, so there's a lot of mapping that would have to be done, but I do think that it's uh, um, that that it's an these are important insights that I think might shed light on this. One last thing I want to close. So Janitsyn, uh was uh, uh, I think he had a complicated relationship with religion, um, but I think his insights are particularly felt by people who have very deep religious convictions. Uh, in part because if you look back at some of the things that uh, that he's talking about about how uh, about the uh, um, uh, about the, uh, um, uh, the the gangrenous boundary you know that's the language of people who who are who are uncompromising in certain ways about what is right and what is wrong and who think the existing system is very far gone and I think in America many people most people probably either on the left and the right you know they're they, they think, you know, I'm not sure there's a gangrenous boundary. They're just kind of slightly ill at this point. But for people who really do feel like the existing government and existing culture 
has gone away from what they think of as eternal truths. This the sense that they have to cleanse themselves, avoid the spiritual death uh, of complicity in any way with what they see as sin. Um, that I think is an especially important one, which is makes it unsurprising that many of the top uh, the people who are who litigated the key cases, whether 303 Creative now, the wedding for, uh, website case, or Barnett uh, and uh, uh, and Woolley, which I think both involved uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, um, uh, that those are those are cases that are. Uh, uh, that were brought by people who really did feel an alienation from the existing system uh, because of the religiosity. So now I'm uh, look, looking forward to our conversation. All right, Eugene, let me start with uh, this last point you made about the link with religion, because the, the thing that strikes me immediately is the extent to which these values show up in other provisions of the Constitution. You might see some of it in the privilege against self-incrimination, but I, I'm, I'm more interested in the moment at the, the uh, establishment clause, the extent to which you know, forcing someone to support something that the person believes to be a lie or a false religion. And, you know, do, do we do we understand, uh, you know, making people uh, use certain pronouns or participate in certain Pride Month events, et cetera, as, as, as the equivalent of, uh, you know, or, or diversity trainings as, as, as compelling them to affirm a truth that they don't believe. I mean, there's this, of course, this very difficult speech conduct divide here, but does this perspective have anything to say on what, where we should be drawing the line in terms of what counts as an establishment, what's just, uh, you know, part of an acceptable civic religion. We've long had many symbols that draw us together, even though there are some dissenters from them. Um, but how can we be one as a nation and still preserve space for people who who disagree on, you know, some of these some of these matters? Should we should we view them in religious terms? Um, so so I, I, uh, those are, I think great questions. And I do think that this ties pretty closely to the establishment clause, although to part of the establishment clause jurisprudence that is actually quite uncontroversial uh, in, uh, uh, in American law, which is the prohibition on coercion. And even setting aside kind of psychological coercion as in Levy Weissman, you're talking about outright coercion, where you actually have to say things, go to religious services uh, uh, and participate in them by actually saying things uh, that, uh, uh, that are religious it is, I think, very broad a consensus on the Supreme Court. Uh, and in lower courts as well, that that's impermissible. So there was a controversy, I want to say some 15 years ago, I believe in the Air Force, where uh, somebody, um, uh, where there was, a, there was a, a, an oath prescribed, maybe by statute even, uh, at least by regulation, but I think by statute, which said something or other, and it said, so swear or affirm the following, at the end it said, so help me God. And somebody refused to include the so help me God, and the Air Force said no. You're required to say the whole thing, including so help me God. What they were missing is the law said swear or affirm. And affirm, the meaning of affirm, generally speaking, in this kind of context, obviously, it means different things in other contexts. But in this context, it means like an oath, except without the invocation of God. And that had actually, that's in the Constitution, in the Fourth Amendment and in, in the body of the Constitution. When it talks about oaths, it talks about oath or affirmation because in part because of religious dissenters, I think it was mostly Quakers, who take seriously a particular portion of the New Testament, which, which Jesus, as I understand it, uh, essentially is saying to people, swear not at all. I think it was Jesus, somebody big, uh, uh, saying that let your yay be yay uh, and your nay be nay, uh, and that should be enough. You shouldn't invoke God uh, to support that. So they took that, uh, the, um, uh, that, that quite literally. And it's been a part of American recognition that people ought not have to say religious things that they, that they don't approve of. Um, likewise, uh, a lot of lower courts have said that uh, um, uh, you can't condition early release from prison on participation in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or uh, um, uh, and uh, that uh, the, uh, the uh, this is because 
uh, AA has a religious component. It's a very ecumenical component, but it has a religious component. And you could say, look, you have to be in some sort of alcohol recovery program, but there's got to be a non-religious option. So I totally agree, uh, uh, agree with that. And I think this is an area where the law has was already very firmly on that side. Right, though I'm not sure if you extend that from the religion side to the speech side. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court hasn't spoken definitively, but a lot of case law suggests that if you have to take part in some alcohol or drug program that requires you to admit that you have a problem, maybe you right. sincerely don't believe you have a problem, right. but at least once you cross the line of violating our criminal laws, which generally involves some kind of harm, whether to right. others or society more right. generally, we can say we we don't think you've adequately proven your reform or rehabilitation, et cetera, even though that's going to put a penalty on people who sincerely believe right. I don't have a drug problem right. or I'm not a child molester or something else. So at some point when you have committed a crime, we can impose some burdens on conscience. I think this is a more right. restricted principle for people who are otherwise law abiding can't be compelled to take part in, in, in ritual affirmations of things that they may not believe. Right, so, uh, so I, I, I very much uh, uh, agree with you uh, about, about the possible limitations of this. And I do want to stress that American law does not, I think cannot have a categorical no compelled speech rule. It might be able to have a categorical no compelled religious practice rule, but not a no compelled speech rule. So just to, to give an example that I think echoes very much, very much with what you're saying, um, it is quite routine, and I think probably right, for judges to credit, uh, to, 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 to count in a uh, in a, uh, defendant's favor at sentencing and a convicted criminal's favor at sentencing that this person has um, has repented his secular sins, right? And said, "I feel really sorry about this. I was wrong," you know. There are problems with that, of course. A lot of those statements are doubtless insincere, precisely because there's there's pressure. But I do think there's a sense. Look, you know, we ought to figure out: is this person is this person, uh, is this person uh, uh, showed rem is, uh, is this person remorseful or not? But I think if the judge were to credit in favor of someone, oh yes, I've seen God and I've now become religious, I think we'd be much more skeptical about that. And I think rightly so. Um, likewise, in employment. Right. Uh, so uh, in, in the government employment context, uh, I think, generally speaking, people can't be required to say religious things and have to be exempted from that. Surely there are exceptions. For example, if you are hired as a chaplain in the military, well, you've got to be you've got a chaplain. You, if you say, well, but I don't want to say God, I don't want to talk about God and say, well, you should find another line of work. Uh, but generally speaking, if you were to require a school teacher, for example, to, uh, to my guess is, by the way, even if uh, with regard to leading the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, while, um, uh, while it's not unconstitutional to have under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, it might be unconstitutional to require a school teacher to say that. Uh, but it's quite clear that there are all sorts of things you can require a school teacher to say that. And the school teacher says, but I don't like algebra. I, I don't believe in algebra. So, well, you're a math teacher. Uh, so, so we have to we have to recognize that there have to be limits to this no speech compulsion principle. But one question is why is there such a principle at all? And I think part of it, what Solzhenitsyn is telling us, it's about allowing people to maintain their self respect, and that that is what uh, the, and the respect of others, and that requiring people to say things that they view as a lie undermines that in a way that's not just spiritually wounding to them but makes them less effective participants in public debate and democratic self-government. All right, so we have some excellent questions and three of them converge on these related topics. One of them, what kind of compulsion and second, by whom? So when the First Amendment's being framed, there's a lot of thought about colonists being punished for seditious libel, you know, it's the crown, bringing either the threat of imprisonment or ruinous fines to bear upon people. So you might view it, it it's either you know, tyranny of those in power or Tocqueville tyranny of the majority using classic governmental coercion. And the situation today looks different in several ways. One of them is that uh, as several commentators note, the academy and the university 
are these loci of power, not directly governmental power, though they receive a lot of governmental funding and support and accreditation. Uh, and so it's not clear, the First Amendment doesn't govern private universities, unless they say they're gonna follow it, uh, though obviously it does govern public universities. And the related issue is that we're not necessarily talking about tyranny of the numerical majority. Uh, we're talking about tyranny of the culturally powerful who may in polls be a relatively small fringe on either side, but very vocal and very activist. People tend to forget that John Stuart Mill in writing on liberty, mm -hmm. his biggest concern was not the you know governmental coercion so much as the stifling conformity uh, imposed by prevailing opinion, educated opinion and the like. So what words do you have for, for the questioners who are asking about attacks on First Amendment culture in the university, which right. of course is important to underpinning the First Amendment working in the public square, and then, uh, you know, attacks on, you know, the, the firing of, one commentator mentions the uh, question of the firing of Joshua Katz, the suspension of your Ilya Shapiro, you know, di uh, diversity, education, uh, 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 equity and inclusion training and uh, deplatforming of speakers. So how does this how does this fit uh, right. within a framework that's really designed at for you know legal coercion and and what's the role of the law in these kinds of softer minoritarian and culture coercion? Right. So so Zunitsyn is not a lawyer, much less an American First Amendment lawyer. Solzhenitsyn so was, was speaking again as a moral and political philosopher. Uh, and I think if he were here, what he would say is, I am talking to people about what they should do. And in particular, I am saying that they should resist participating in the lie. And then the question might be, well, what legal constraints, legal principles should help them do that? And that's a separate and interesting question. But I'm primarily saying people should resist this. And maybe secondarily, to the extent there are kind of well-intentioned listeners out there, I want them to understand why it's important to, to resist this. Why the people who resist aren't just kind of weirdly pedantic troublemakers but are actually onto something really big that's important in their lives. Um, so let me, get, let me start with an example of where, I'm, where I strongly suspect Solzhenitsyn would both say, yes, you must resist and say, but of course the law won't help you resist. Imagine that somebody concludes that his own religious institution's teachings are a lie and that he can no longer go through the rituals that he believes are are false. You don't have to imagine that. That's much of the history of religion. You know, every schism starts with that. Well, then the answer is, don't just go, uh, uh, go along to get along. I realize that you might get fired from your job at the church. You might get excommunicated. You may get, you may lose important family and personal relationships, but you've got to be an honest man. And if that means you have to quit, or you have to start a schism, that's what you should do. The law won't help you. But, but you should do it in any case. Um, uh, now, I do think when the government is threatening people with jail for, or, or with civil liability for uh, not using a particular pronoun that they think is a lie, but that others think is, is accurate, uh, uh, or for that matter, threatening people who are transgender with jail or fines or whatever for calling themselves by what they think is right. Uh, that I think he would pretty clearly quickly say, uh, or at least he should say, I think, given his argument that that's something the government ought not be doing. When it comes to uh, government employment, again, it's more complicated. And it's more complicated also when it comes to other institutions. So I think one thing we can at least get out of this is that if a university wants to see itself as a place that really does support, support pluralism, of views and approaches to life. It has to be very careful about what it requires people to say. Naturally, it can't be entirely ideologically neutral. It has to set its curriculum. It has to set all sorts of things. And it can't be completely free of speech compulsions. Every one of my exams is a speech compulsion. 
Uh, and I compel you to say things that I think are right. And if you say things that you think are right, you better defend them pretty well <laughs> and explain to me uh, why you are. But the university should be hesitant, for example, about requiring uh, um, uh, assistance in the residence halls to wear, uh, uh, to wear pro-gay rights uh, uh, little badges. It should be hesitant about requiring faculty to have these sort of land acknowledgments with, with regard to, uh, uh, to, to Indian tribes uh, uh, claims over, over certain property. Uh, because it should realize that that is pushing people into a position where they're, where they're dishonest. And so, that that's actually destructive of the mission of the university. Can the government help with this? Could the government require universities to, to check a box either yes we are agreeing to abide by the first amendment as a term of our educational contracts um or no we are not and you know perhaps even channeling financial aid towards those that agree that they are going to abide by the terms of the first amendment etc because uh you know at the moment there's it's not really clear and universities say some very waffly things and then maybe a speaker or a student gets into hot water and the right. university hasn't legally bound itself or taken a position either way on, on that issue so maybe a in terms of people knowing what they're what they're getting into when they're choosing a college and plunking down all that money or the well, government's about, money i think that's a great question it is i think primarily not a question about speech compulsions it is in large measure, at least when you hear debates about this, have to do with speech restrictions. The examples you gave uh, with regard to Ilya Shapiro and uh, Professor Joshua Katz, I think, is, in any case, uh, uh, Professor Katz at Princeton, had to do with punishments that uh, uh, that are contemplated or imposed, pretty likely, uh, based on their actual speech, not based on their silence. Uh, so, but it's an interesting and important question. Uh, I think that, I mean, California has actually prohibited the imposition of campus speech codes for uh, by non-religious universities uh, um, for students. Uh, and that it's not a condition on funding or requirement of disclosure, just a prohibition. Uh, likewise, I think Congress could do that as a either as a condition of the recipient of federal of receipt of federal funds or just as a as a regulation of commerce, in this case commerce and very expensive educational services. I have an 18 year old who's about to go to go to college. So I can tell you they're very expensive. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, uh, so I think it's something that could be done. Whether it should be done or not is a complicated question. You know, there are a lot of problems that further regulation will only exacerbate or will just yield other problems, but it, it might be plausible. I do think that at least in some of these situations, especially with regard to speech compulsion, just simply saying you have to abide by the First Amendment is com is, isn't gonna get you everything because it's an interesting question. Uh, what does the First Amendment say about that? Let's say, for example, the uh, University of California, a public university bound by the First Amendment, were to say all course syllabuses, even though written in the name of the professor, have to include one of these land acknowledgments. I would very much resist that, and I think I could argue that it's unconstitutional because it's compulsion of speech, not just by any employee, but an, by, an, by a professor. On the other hand, you know, I can't claim that the law is open and shut on that. Uh, so, so that it seems to me is the is the more complicated question in many ways. Like, what kinds of speech compulsions really are impermissible? All right, let's 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 segue from there to some of the broader issues raised by Solzhenitsyn. One of them is, uh, you know, someone uh, points out in a question about the the line between you know, dissenting, affirmatively dissenting and keeping silent. Now, this, this becomes a big issue on social media, for example, where of course you're free not to say anything on social media, but then social media are, are dominated by loud mouths of, you know, certain extreme persuasions, but social media also wind up banning people for saying unpopular right. accurate facts or for calling some, for calling Bruce Jenner as opposed to Caitlyn Jenner or, right. or something like that. So, you know, issues like this were raised with COVID-19, issues were raised with the, you know, the president's son. Um, so is it enough to keep one's mouth shut or should we maybe be more humble and say, look, you know, from my own perspective, I have to do what I can. What do, maybe all I can do is not speak on Twitter or right. whatever forum right. has already been corrupted, or would this, or should we be viewing this more silence as a first step? I, I think there are certain right. people much more ambitious about 
retaking the public square. But how, how would you guide someone in thinking through these issues of not speaking versus voicing dissent? Right. So I think these are these are great questions. These are very they're very important questions. They're ones in which on which I think Solzhenitsyn was deliberately not speaking in uh, uh, in this particular essay. And I think part of the reason might be I think he would say so. Part of it may be just sort of tactical. He'd say, "Look, I understand that it's just so risky to actually outright speak out against the government that I can't I can't realistically demand it even in." Brezhnev era Russia uh, of, my, of my country. Uh, but I think part of it is also, I think, that he thinks that, well, I do think he thinks silence in the face of evil is corrupting, that actual outright cooperation with evil in mouthing its, its message, he thinks is more corrupt. So if you don't talk about something, then, uh, you know, there are, uh, uh, that uh, that's, that's a weakness on your part, but at least it was not a positive action to promote an ideology that you think is wrong. And in fact, actually, silence, there are, there are a lot of explanations for silence, I think you, that, that, that might, be, might be quite credible. Sometimes people don't talk because they're actually not sure that what they're saying is right, whether they what they think about saying is right. They think it is, but they, 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 they want to be cautious as a matter of, again, their own honesty. Um, uh, uh, sometimes they may see, you know, I just think that tactically speaking out about this here is just going to be counterproductive. And I think right. Solzhenitsyn would say that's an honorable choice to make. He wouldn't say it's honorable, even for tactical reasons, to speak out in favor of something that you think is wrong. So I think he would say it's more corrupting, it's more gangrenous uh, that, uh, to, to actually speak than to remain silent. All right. We have a couple of questions that I think get to a maybe a more cultural, moral, or, or spiritual dimension here. And it's a good reminder for us lawyers and law professors. You know, my students always start out by thinking about a judicial solution. And I try to push them and say, there's a lot more than judges out there about legislation or executive action or states or other things. But, but some questions here go further. Maybe, maybe we're missing the point. As you say, Solzhenitsyn is not a lawyer. He's not writing in the First Amendment context. Maybe we're being too legalistic in thinking in First Amendment terms. Is it is it distracting to think of this primarily as a legal problem, as opposed to thinking about the the the, the courage required? When I think about the the framers, I mean, they were willing to sign their own death warrants by signing right. the the right. Declaration of Independence. They put up with a lot more than we did. You know, you I don't know how well you remember the life in the Soviet Union, but you know, dissenters and refuseniks were willing to put up with losing their jobs, being right. expelled, a, a whole lot more. One questioner suggested maybe we've become too comfortable in America or we expect we shouldn't right. have to pay anything for these freedoms. Is there a way in which kind of standing up and suffering the penalty is is either good for us or at least to be expected of, of citizenship in terms of maybe not affirmatively retaking the public square, but bearing witness in, in the public square and also for our for our, our souls or our character or virtues, right? You know, it's a very interesting question. And again, I stress, Solzhenitsyn was not a lawyer. He wasn't writing a legal prescription. Um, his primary audience was people whom he wanted to persuade to do to do the right thing, uh, and by 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 their own standards of right. Uh, and uh, so, so there, there's. We can't expect this to be to be a recipe for a particular legal doctrine. At the same time, I do think that when we're thinking about um, what the value is of uh, of uh, not compelling speech, whether it's a value relevant to legal doctrine or just relevant to an institution's setting up its own sets of set of rules, I think it's important to to, I think he has an important insight that one value is allowing people to be honest, which is often in the interests of the institution or in the interest of society. So for example, I think a university ought to keep this in mind, as I mentioned, in, in deciding when to compel people to say things and deciding what accommodations can be made. So for example, even to say, look, you know, if you don't agree with something you wanna say on the exam, please feel free to say upfront, I'm giving the answer based on the material we've learned, but I think this is wrong. And we won't mark you down for that. 
Why? Because we actually want you to be honest people. We want you to feel like you're not complicit in something that's wrong, because those are the kinds of people that we think will ultimately help better promote, even if they, we think they're in error on one or two particular things, they will help better promote the search for truth that the university is all about. To give an example from just several years ago, I had a blog post about this with regard to a different area, with regard to Colin Kaepernick not wanting to participate in the, uh, uh, in, uh, or to do what he viewed as participation in the national anthem. And I, I tried to point out a bunch of different things, one of which is, you know, he is an entertainer fundamentally in many ways. And uh, uh, he is employed by an entertainment organization that wants to maintain the, uh, uh, the affection of the audience. At the same time, they have to appreciate that, that while to many people is, is either something they welcome or they think nothing of it, to some people, maybe people who seem a little obsessed, but still some people um, uh, is a big deal that, ha that having to even stand for this, this ritual is something that is to them impermissible complicity. And maybe if we think about that a lot, we'd say, look, okay, if you'd rather not um, uh, do that, that's fine. You can stay in the locker room uh, 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 for that. And you might say, actually, we won't allow you, for example, to kneel. There may be the distinction between, between active and passive. We won't allow you to put, hold up signs because this is our show and this is our entertainment that we're presenting for our audience. But we'll at least let you stay out of it if that's what you prefer. So uh, this, this connects up to an excellent question that our uh, organizer, Alita Cass, asks. You know, if you read the essay, which I have in front of me, Solzhenitsyn goes a little bit beyond complete silence. He suggests that we should at once walk out from a session, meeting, lecture, play, or film as soon as he hears the speaker utter a lie, ideological right. drivel, or right. shameless propaganda. For those of us who are, who are troubled by the excesses of DEI training, should we be standing up and walking out as our, our, our witness against this? Right, right. So I think, I think there, there are two uh, aspects to, to this issue. Um, one is, to what extent but is he talking about the symbolic value of the walkout? That the very act of physically walking out sends a message that just not showing up might not. Um, and uh, uh, to what extent, or alternatively, to what extent he's saying you need to walk out simply because you don't, you shouldn't be complicit. If you can walk out quietly, if you can stand in the back so you can more easily walk out, go ahead and do that. The important thing is you not be there, you not be there participating. I'm inclined to say, given the overall tone of the of the article, the overall focus of the article, the essay, is that he's really talking about the latter. That there might be some symbolic component to this, but that's not the main thing. By the way, interestingly, in Willie V. Maynard, this was part part of the issue. I believe the lower court decided in favor of Woolley's ability to tape over um, "Live Free or Die" on the license plate. Not Woolley, Maynard. It's the Maynard's ability to, to tape over uh, uh, "Live Free or Die" in the license plate because that was symbolic expression. And the Supreme Court said we don't have to reach that because. The prohibition on, uh, on taping over it is itself a speech compulsion. The separate question is, what about employment? That to what extent can the employer say, look, you know, I appreciate that what we're t teaching you, you think is a lie, but it's important that you learn this. And, you know, it's hard to cap into just DEI training, right? What there are other kinds of training. How about training in safety with grounding electrical equipment? I kind of hope that employers say, oh, better show up. And if you walk out either silent, either silently or vocally, we're gonna say, you know, I'm not sure we should, we should trust you given that we don't want our employees and customers electrocuted. Uh, so, so now you might say, well, one is ideological, one is not, maybe, maybe, but, um, but there, are, there are other situations where there might be very serious, of course, there, there are disputes about, about uh, public health, disputes about COVID, disputes about all sorts of things like that. Right. But presumably a public hospital is going to be training its medical staff and other staff with regard to avoiding infection. And they're gonna be training them along, along the lines they, the hospital supports and not each particular objector. So that's a very difficult issue. I, but I, I, I think it is important, again, to separate law here. I mean, people these days, protesters seem to expect they should be able to protest, and the protest is so noble there should be no consequences. But Martin Luther King understood that there would be 
jail as a consequence for his protests. And, and that was part of the power of the witness of, 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 uh, of peaceful protests and, and, and Gandhi and the like. So it may be that the employer has the right to punish you or fire you, et cetera, right. but that nonetheless, you, you should be willing right. to draw some right. lines that you will suffer for, or you'll move to a different job right. or, or something else. And again, that requires courage, which is both not something that we prioritize as much in our virtue training these days. It's, it's much more about kindness and niceness than about, you know, standing standing up for these things, but also that that means a willingness to, to take some pain and some, some sacrifice, uh, which maybe is less obvious now than it might have been in the, in the Soviet Union where the lines maybe were a little more clearly drawn. Uh, yeah, uh, what you said reminds me of a line, I forget whom it's from. I think it's somebody ancient, but somebody, maybe it's somebody we just ascribe these, uh, we just, just assign loose lose quotes from is that courage is the most important of virtues because it is preservative of all other virtues. Um, so, so I do think that that's what, what Solzhenitsyn would say. Look, I'm not telling you you're going to get off scot-free, but I'm just telling you what you ought to do. Um, uh, and of course, great religious teachers have said exactly the same to, 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 to people. Um, I, I will say, though, so long as we have a compelled speech doctrine, one question we might want to ask is, well, it should say so compelled speech. So long as we have a free speech doctrine, which does say certain kinds of protest, you don't need to go to jail for it because you are constitutionally protected in them and may be protected by statute and such. Uh, to what extent should, should that extend to compelled speech and why? And I think Solzhenitsyn has something of an answer to that. But if you're quite right, he has different fish to fry. Yeah, and, and it reminds me a little, we have a question about what the lies are that he's fighting mm -hmm. against. And I think it's important to keep in mind that he, the way I read it, he understands the, the core of the lie to be this, this ideology and a, a, you know, that, that totalizes and has a political vision of everything. And you know, Václav Havel understands uh, an anti-politics to be a form of resistance, just not letting life be turned into this, the right. way in which, you know, you're either, you're all good or all evil if you're on the party side or on the other side, and the extent to which people these days won't have friends across political lines. Right. Uh, it used to be, you know, religious lines are big dividers, and that doesn't mean much anymore, but, but politics is a big divider. So the, the anti-politics of politics might just be not letting everything become political. You know, in, in, uh, Tocqueville's day, so much was local and so much was cooperation and right. people weren't sorted into two big parties and they hadn't moved all to be red states or, or, or right. blue states. So if, if, if we think that, you know, people uh, on, on the fringe have, have ruined a lot in America by over politicizing it, what, is that, what does that suggest for, for us? I mean, there's a temptation to be tribal in response, a temptation right. to embrace a counter ideology but are we falling into a mirror image version of the same trap if we fight fire with fire? Right, so again, great questions to which I don't have much of an answer. I think Solzhenitsyn, we may have had answers in others of his works, but in this essay, he, he, he was uh, focusing on very particular things. But let me begin, because I do think he has something to say about this. Let me begin by answering the question of what the lie was. As best I understand it, it was, it was everything. And it was, oh, the Communist Party won 99% of the vote at the last election. It was, we fulfilled the five-year plan. It was socialism or communism is on, just on the horizon. Uh, it, uh, it was, we are, we are building better whatever than the capitalists are. All of it, all of it. And the thing is, everybody knew, and maybe they didn't know about all of the aspects, but everybody knew that particular things were lies. Uh, they, they just utterly routine. You, you, you were aware that things, the things that that the, that you were expected to echo, you were expected to say, were actually not accurate. Um, and I think he would say that's part of the thing that tells you that you are in a corrupt system. That it's not just, well, now that you've recognized the system is corrupt, you should not lie in support of that corruption. I think that's part of it. 
But I think another part of it is you should just not lie. And maybe at first you don't think it's corrupt. You just think, why are they making me say this? This is not true. So you shouldn't say it. And then maybe as you see more and more of that, you see the corruption inherent in the system, or maybe corruption in a particular facet of the system. Um, so, uh, so I, I think this ties into your point about politicization. I don't think he was upset at the politicization of life quite that way. And my understanding is that in fact in Russia, there was very much this sense of, you know, you you need to you need to be only friends with people who see the world your way, because otherwise they may denounce you to the KGB for what you say over dinner. Uh, but uh, uh, but I think one thing he might have said was that if you if everybody does decide to really, really decide to oppose the lies from their own side, as well as from others, if they just say, look, I'm sorry. Uh, I agree with you on a lot, but I can't, I can't say this, uh, then maybe that will lead to better human relations where everybody sort of says, yeah, I'm, I'm not about team red or team blue or team communist, or team capitalist. I'm about just making sure that I'm an honest man. And if you are about being, making sure that you're an honest man, even if I disagree with you on a lot, that's a better basis for our relationship than just that we're on the same team. All right, and, and now maybe we can draw on a, a question that was asked much earlier, but a, a good question that observed that Justice Thomas in talking with one of his former clerks said, you know, when I read some opinions of my colleagues, they, 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 they say things about racism that I, I don't believe are true, uh, things about who supported drug laws, and, and that when a colleague on the court has an opinion that has something that he believes not true, he won't join the opinion. Uh, I think it's an interesting question of role morality. I've been right. working through my first four years on the court. So right. you, know, you can talk about what it's like as a professor. I, I think it's different for a professor, from right. a legislator, from a law clerk, from a judge. I mean, I don't believe it's a lie for a legislator to kind of cut some deals and compromises because that's right. part of what the job is. And no one would understand the legislator usually to be lying in, in taking half a loaf. Uh, unless it had some, you know, recitals or findings that the legislator thought were false. I don't think a law clerk is lying if the law clerk works on an opinion the law clerk disagrees with, because no one understands that to be the law clerk speech. But, you know, you're a professor, I'm a former professor, and academic speech is a little different. Academic speech is fundamentally supposed to be the professor's own speech. Right. So what should we make of these professors who go around signing amicus briefs like their petitions when there's 100 people who sign it? And I seriously doubt all 100 people like researched everything that was in right. every footnote or I'm not sure they all read every word. Um, right. Is that ultimately Solzhenitsyn needs and says that's up to your own conscience. But when you're advising the people on the webinar, how, how do you think about that in writing an article, co-authoring an article, signing an amicus brief as to where you draw those lines? And then I, maybe right. I can talk a little bit about what it's like as a litigator and as a judge. Right. No, I, I, again, excellent question. And I think you're absolutely right that a lot has to depend on your role. And also, I think something does have to depend with how fundamentally corrupt you think the system is or how uh, uh, whether it's the big picture system or, or the system that you're in. The fact is that in most human institutions, people are expected to compromise. And one form of compromise is indeed signing on to something that you don't completely agree with. And in fact, sometimes I, my understanding is it's not uncommon for judges to sign on to an opinion that even they think is mistaken, but they don't think it's so badly mistaken that it's important for them to either take the time to write a dissent or write a, a dissent without any, without any explanation. Um, and uh, that, uh, that, you know, that's just the way, the way that the system works. And, you know, I think Solzhenitsyn might disapprove of that, but I think maybe the answer is, you know, if you're trying to dislodge Soviet totalitarianism, then you might need to be more militant than if you're just trying to make the system work effectively in a situation where, you know, if there are two votes on a three judge panel, the third, it, there may not be a lot, uh, a lot gained and something lost by the third judge saying no. Like every time he disagrees, not just in really important cases, but every time saying, no, I'm just not going to sign on. So, so it may be different in, uh, in different kinds of systems and maybe different dif depending on different roles. Um, and I, I very much appreciate the point about the academic. 
that I do think that when we sign something as an academic, we are expected to make our own decisions uh, and based on real knowledge. And I think there are two components. One is that you shouldn't sign on to anything that you disagree with the given part. And there have certainly been amicus briefs that say, look, you know, there's much I disagree with here. I agree with here, but I've got to really be able to endorse pretty much every sentence. There's a secondary question, which is to what extent can you sign on to something where you don't disagree with it? In fact, you agree with it, but if you were really candid, you'd have to say, I'm not really an expert on the subject. To what extent can you say, well, about the people who write this, I trust, and therefore I'm willing to sign on. And I have to say, I don't think I've ever signed on to a brief where I felt I had no real knowledge about it just because I signed on just because somebody asked me to lend their name to it. There have been times when I say, look, you know, I understand the big picture, but there are all these historical assertions in this portion of the brief. And I'm a consumer of this history. I'm not a producer of it. Uh, and I just trust what Doug Laycock says about religion clauses. And if he says it, I have to agree with his normative judgment. But if he says something historical or Mike McConnell, I, I can trust him. I and again, I think that's something that, that's acceptable to a point. But yeah, past a certain point, you are making a claim about academic expertise that is just not an honest claim. Anymore. Yeah. I, think, I think it's very important to differentiate the role morality of a lawyer from that of, a, oh, right. of being a signatory of a brief or a client. As a lawyer, I don't think you should just be your client's mouthpiece. You should say, I, I can't say that, that's not right, et cetera. But within the bounds of, of candor to the tribunal, I think it's appropriate to argue for positions that you believe as a judge you might not vote for, but you have a good faith basis for arguing for them. And it, you know, on the amicus briefs, I, I, I agree. I, I think it's, it's best to know all that's in the brief, but you ought to at least have a pretty firm confidence that there's you know, nothing in the brief you fundamentally disagree right. with and and you've you you've assured yourself of all the all the major points that you're making and it shouldn't just be a a, a cheerleading petition you know go along with it or, or or sign on to be popular i think the interesting thing for me is as a judge and i've talked judges have a range of different views um i think i have to draw a distinction between there's lies there are things that are wrong and then there's incorrect I will never sign anything that's a lie. And the lie implies that it's knowing, uh -huh. intentional, or at least reckless. Uh, and I, I'm amazed at the freedom with which lawyers accuse one another of lying. And you have to be very right. careful about that. Right. I will also never sign on to anything I believe is wrong. Now, some other judges will take the position you did, which is, hey, I lost. It was a fair process. This one is not worth dissenting. Um, you know, I'd rather in that situation drop a, a footnote to the majority opinion that at least signals Judge Beavis would affirm on whatever grounds. Like, I don't feel an obligation to write the dissent in every last summary judgment, fact specific three page opinion. But, you know, if, if but I, I won't affirm it. But, you know, a, a judge I very much respect, Judge Jeff Sutton of the Sixth Circuit, convinced me at baby judge school. If it's a 55, 45 kind of question right. and you're talking with someone, you're like you're reading the facts. Was there enough consent here or was there a waiver? And these factual issues, people in very good faith can read the same record, listen to the testimony and slightly different reads on it. And it's a 55, 45, maybe 60, 40 kind of issue. I don't view it as a lie. I, I, I'm not confident enough to say it's wrong. Right. And I don't necessarily have the obligation to stand on principle in that situation versus the kind of law social justice is talking about where there's just, I will be standing for a principle that I oppose. So I think there's, there's prudence involved in these kinds of calls, but the prudence does have principle to back it up and you can't just endlessly balance it away in the name of, I wanna get something in the future. I, I very much respect that, you know, Justice Kennedy taught me we don't, trade votes here. That's what right. they do over in the, at the Capitol. We don't, there's not horse trading. Like you, you, you sign on to an opinion on its merits and you make an honest call. But as Solzhenitsyn says, everyone's going to draw that line differently. Just make sure you're calling it honestly and it's not being inflected by self-interest or Machiavellianism or something else like that. So right. I believe we're at the end of our time. Uh, Alita, am I right? You are right. I apologize. This was such an enjoyable conversation. I'm, I'm a little bit um, late in closing this out, but um, 
Thank you both for uh, a really enjoyable conversation. On behalf of the Federalist Society, Judge Bebas and Professor Volok, um, and our audience for uh, a, a really in interesting, thought-provoking event. Um, we welcome listener feedback by email at info at fedsoc.org. You can visit our website and our new Instagram account, FedSoc, F-O-T, and watch your emails for additional content and news of upcoming events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. <laughs>